it's super important in any manufacturing uh, environment to standardize your process. But as we watch the silver tsunami come in and uh, the, the experienced workforce leaves, it's going to become even more important for us to to save that information because those people they're they're not going to be around for forever, you know. Hey, it's Ari Santiago, President and CEO of IT Direct. Welcome to this episode of Made in America. I'm here with uh, Tom McGuire, Vice President of Business Development from uh, Industrial Heater, almost a 100-year-old Connecticut success business. Uh, really excited to talk to Tom here all about uh, what's going on in Industrial Heater and uh, his views overall. Tom, thanks so much for uh, coming on, man. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Ari. Appreciate it. Well, listen, it's the Made in America podcast, so we start off with the same two questions. What do you guys make and why do you make it? Process heaters. So um, most of our heaters are used in injection molding and extrusion processes, um, but we do a number of applications, um, and and some of the applications are beyond me. Um, most of what we do is custom made. Our customers specify um, a heater use, and, and we make it to print. So um, in addition to the heater business, we have a contract sheet metal fabricating unit, um, which is what I'm uh, spend most of my time doing, and. Uh, we do, uh, or we service a range of industries on that side as well. So, uh, one of the things I'm most proud of is that we we service a ton of different customers in uh, a lot of different industries, and um, we touch a lot of facets of American life. So, yeah, that's pretty awesome, man. Yeah. You guys been doing it for almost a century, so yep. so we want to get into that. But let's get kind of a little bit of uh, maybe the background, actually, of you know why do you guys do it? Well, how did how did this all get started? How did we get to kind of where we are today? Sure. So my uh, my great grandfather Len Steiner um, is a Kansas guy. He uh, he fought in World War One. He was an ambulance driver, uh, horse drawn ambulance in World War One. Um, came back and he was a tinkerer and engineer by trade, and he um, started to develop heaters that were mostly used in the garment industry. So this is New York, 1921. Um, he's servicing uh, mostly immigrants that are making clothing, uh, drying garments, um, using the heaters to produce the garments. And he does that for about 20, 30 years before plastics starts to become relevant in the late 40s, uh, 50s. And um, he gets approached by a, uh, a guy named, by the name of Ren Morse, who started a, a company called Industrial Machine, Machine Supply. Um, and together they patented the the first heater band that went on what was called the midget molder, one of the first injection molding machines. Um, and the rest is history. Um, we spent the next, you know, 60, 70 years doing heater bands, mostly for plastics. Um, but like I said, it goes into a, a wide range of applications. So. So maybe explain, like, for those of us that don't 100% know what a heater band is, what, sure. is, what is that? Um, so in the plasticating process, mostly injection molding and extrusion, like I said, um, uh, one of the most important things is that you're melting plastic down into a liquid state um, to be injected or to be uh, extruded. So the heaters that we make go on those machines to melt the plastic down. Uh, they're called heater bands because for the most part, they look like a ring. Um, and... Um, go either around the barrel uh, of the um, the extruder or the injection molding machine and um, uh, melt the plastic. So it just melts it so that it can get then reformed into whatever the final shape is going to be? Yeah. So they, they, they operate kind of like uh, the heating system in your house. So um, they, they basically just switch on and off um, and they're operated with a thermocouple that's tied to a controller. And... Um, you know, some of them can get up to 350 degrees Fahrenheit and, uh, depending on what, what their, uh, process is, um, some people even use the heater bands for, um, uh, metal or gold or silver. Um, and like I said, uh, you know, a lot of our customers do stuff with our heaters that we don't even know about. Uh, <laughs> we just, we just make them for their machines. That's right. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, listen, you go to the website, you see you guys doing stuff in pharma, right? You're doing stuff in oil and gas. Like, so that's not, that's not plastic extrusion. So right. what are you guys doing in those industries? And, and there's all kinds of different heaters, right? You've got the submersibles and, and different stuff. So like, sure. how much is that kind of mix into the, the product mix? Um, so we also make immersion heaters, um, and those are, um, heaters that go into liquid, um, applications. So, um, 
you know, if, if someone's uh, making perfume, for example, and needs that to get to a certain temperature, they'll use one of our heaters to um, heat the, the bath to whatever temperature they need it to be. Sure. Um, actually, if you go and you drive into New York, you might notice the water towers on the top of the apartment buildings. Sure. Um, we make about um, 70% of the heaters that go into those tanks and just keep the water from freezing in the, uh, in the winter. Um, and then, um, you know, it, it, on the medical device side, um, our heaters are, are used in the plasticating processes that, wow. that our customers um, use to make medical uh, IV tubes and syringes and bags and everything in between. So, um, like I said, we service a lot of industries. Our customers range from the distributors, the OEMs that build the equipment that make plastic parts to the, the end users who are, who are making this product. So. And so is there any relationship between being a horse-drawn ambulance driver and this business, or it was just sort of a happenstance unrelated? Coincidence. Uh, I think uh, Len was a patriot. Um, yeah, he, sure. he did get a, uh, a Medal of Valor uh, while he was there, and we still have that hanging in our, our building. Um, and like I said, he was a tinkerer. He, he really liked to invent. Um, one of the uh, his most famous applications was uh, in Times Square. There used to be a Marlboro man who was smoking a cigarette, <laughs> yep. and there was a puff of steam that would come out of his mouth after he exhaled. And my great grandfather he invented the uh, or he he made the the heater that went onto that device to make the steam. So <laughs> no kidding. Yeah. Look at that. It's pretty cool. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, so what's kind of your journey like, Tom, you know, here we are like kind of getting into the family business. So you're the, let's see, so it's your great grandfather. So it'd be your fourth generation yep. in the business. So kind of, you know, how'd your uh, long and strange windy road end up here? Um, well, I joke with people that I've been working at the company on and off for 16 years. Um, I started in high school um, doing minor assembly work, uh, just putting sleeving on fiberglass wires. Uh, nothing fun, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and then went off to college. I studied uh, international business and finance. Um, I thought I was going to be an investment banker one day, and I learned how to speak Chinese. I lived in China for a year. Um, and went off and worked for a couple other companies before I, I thought, um, you know, why don't I go and, and try my hand at the family business? And, um, it, it turned out that I actually really enjoyed manufacturing. Um, finance wasn't for me after all. And, uh, and I've been doing this now for, um, professionally for about six or seven years, um, working in manufacturing. That's great. What is yeah. it about manufacturing that's kind of like enticed you or, you know, what did you see when you looked at sort of like finance, which I think, um, you know, has been sort of like one of the primary things people thought about doing. Yeah. Um, but what is it about manufacturing that's really enticed you? Um, I like making things that you can touch. Um, and uh, I really enjoy uh, the process. Um, how do you go from a customer's demand um, to making what they want? And, and providing it. Um, and and we, we obviously work with uh, high-tech equipment to, to make the product. Um, uh, we've engineered these products over 100 years, um, close to 100 years. And um, just seeing it all come to fruition, you know, and, you know, even something simple like this plastic bottle right here, you know, our heaters are, are, are making or helping to make these products. Um, and, and I think it, it's, it's something that a lot of people don't think about anymore. How, how is this stuff made? They take for granted that this is in their hand and that they can just have it. But um, it's important and it's, it's exciting to be a part of it. Yeah, no doubt. And I mean, clearly, clearly medical devices probably weren't a front of mind when the company first started 100 years ago. Right. So like how has the customer mix evolved uh, over time? Um, it's a great question and it's, it's hard for me to say, you know, um, yeah, I would say s most of our business has been in plastics. Um, the end use is, is never quite apparent. Um, most of who we supply to are either building the equipment or they're reselling the heaters for something else. Um, and, um, so it's sort of changed and evolved over time, but not because you're not always right. The end application, yeah, hard to know, like kind of where it's at. Yeah, um, you know, you know, Poland Spring would have the name brand, right? But right. I would never know whether or not our heaters are making Poland Spring bottles. Um, 
but I could guarantee you that they are. It's in, in some shape or form. There's involved somewhere. in there somewhere. Yeah. So, I mean, what's it? So, you know, the, how has the business itself changed, you know, say over the last 20 or 30 years, obviously, you know, manufacturing has been up and down, especially in the U.S. and in the Northeast. Mm -hmm. You know, what does kind of industrial heater look like, you know, uh, over, how has it changed over the last sort of 40 years? We've been remarkably stable. Um, as you can imagine, the heater band business is kind of a niche market. Mm. Um, and, you know, o over time, we've we've had our ups and downs with recessions. And just like anybody else, 9-11 uh, was a big, big um, uh, down time for us and for the American economy in general. But, um, you know, a as you can see, after 99 years, we've, we've managed to weather all the storms and and um, and keep doing what we do. So how, how, tell me a little about the sort of the family trajectory, you know, how has it transitioned and has the business remained, I mean, it sounds like if plastics are a big deal, it seems like there's probably a big growth phase when plastics started to become a big thing, right? right. Uh, you know, in the forties and fifties, like you talked about. So, you know, has the business kind of stayed kind of growing little by little, been remarkably stable across the generations? Like, you know, you've transitioned from your great grandfather to your grandfather, your dad and so on. Yep. You know, maybe just sort of talk through that. There's a lot of family businesses in manufacturing. So we've we've remained relatively stable, grown incrementally over the years, and um, the growth that we've had that we have seen has mostly been through acquisition. Um, we bought a, a another a, one of our competitors in the early 2000s called Thermco. Um, in 2012, we acquired a sheet metal fabricator in Wallingford called High Tech Fabricating, um, and we kept that customer base and we used the equipment that they were using to synergize uh, the manufacture our, our production capacities in, in regards to the heaters. Um, and we u utilize that to, to grow our, um, our uh, sheet metal customer base as well. So we went from mostly servicing plastics companies to, you know, now having a, a hand in a little bit of aerospace, a little bit of uh, biotech, um, some of the healthcare industry with our sheet metal applications. Um, we were also able to um, start selling um, enclosures and uh, brackets and other features to our OEM customers for their equipment um, with our sheet metal capabilities. So, so a little bit more vertical integration to give them like a more complete product. Yep. So how does the sheet metal fab and the heater applications kind of work together? Well, the heaters um, are made out of metal. They're <laughs> yeah, they're they're uh, sure. steel uh, or galvanized or um, ink and nail, most of them, um, and so. Those the the uh, the uh, components to our heater bands are mostly cut on a laser or punched, um, and then we um, uh, form them using hydraulic shapers or uh, rolling benches. Um, we also have CNC press brakes um, that we use for some of our heaters. Uh, they're not all round; some of them are uh, have right angles and are square. And um, so that equipment which we didn't have for a very long time, uh, brought in in 2012 and really increased the quality of our heaters. And mm -hmm. um, like I said, uh, in increased our customer base as well. No, that's pretty exciting. And how have you found the acquisitions to work out? You know, like, so you, how did you find them? Were they just happenstance? Was it strategic growth? Um, a lot of them have been just our involvement in the industry um, and, and networking throughout the state. Um, you know, we're, we're also very involved in Plastics uh, Industry Association, which is, um, I, th I believe, the third largest trade association in the country. Mm -hmm. um, and just through networking and, and knowing who's out there and what people's needs are, um, we've uh, we've come into contact with the right people and made the right moves. And find those right opportunities. And so what are some of the challenges that you, I mean, so you probably, this latest acquisition is probably more kind of in your experience it's been while you've been kind mm -hmm. of more active. Like talk about the integration. So you bought the company. Did you guys, would you bring people on board, just customers and equipment? Talk about the integration you guys did there. We, uh, we basically brought all of the equipment, all of the people and all the customers over into our facility in Cheshire. Um, and there was a bit of a learning curve. The, um, the former um, owner of the company stayed on for about a year before he moved on. So he helped us integrate, which was great. And then most of the employees stayed for, for um, um, a good amount of time. And, and even to this day, a lot of them are still with us. So um, a lot of that expertise came over with, with the sheet metal fabricating side of it. And um, we've, uh, we've leveraged that to, to 
to stay with those customers and find new ones as well. So, so their customers were getting not getting heating elements for them, just like trying to follow like the total like connection between, yeah. you know, the the two businesses. So the synergies were on the production side only. Um, yeah. So uh, for a long time, our components are uh, the the steel side of it was either sheared or punched, and our punch was um, you know very old. And it was time to upgrade. Um, and uh, the high tech had not just a, uh, a modern punch, but they had uh, a laser. They had um, CNC bending equipment and they had welders, um, really talented welders. And we brought it all over and um, it, it increased our ability to make a quality product right away. Um, so we weren't sharing things anymore, which there's nothing wrong with sharing things, but when you can laser cut, and um, and punch with accuracy. It's it's a lot easier to make a quality product. No doubt. And this, you're also doing whatever they were doing besides that for the sheet metal for their other customers that were like unrelated. Yep. So kind of grew the business that way by sort of adding another product line that they had going yep. on with them. So uh, you know before we might make a uh, a heater band for a customer. Now we can also make the cover that goes over the uh, extruder barrel. Um, we also bought a company um, in 2016, I believe, that made thermocouples. Um, so now we're doing our own thermocouples in-house. Um, and we can kind of provide that the whole package. Um, auxiliary equipment is is kind of the, the field that we're in as far as plastics is concerned. So, um, yeah, it's it's it, the, the integration has really helped us more on the production side. It wasn't more of a, we want to service heater bands to this this customer base. Um, but we, we fell into the, the industry that, that came with high tech, which was, um, like I said, aerospace, um, some minor tier two and three uh, kind of work. Um, we also uh, service a lot of healthcare companies in the state that, that make um, uh, surgical equipment. Mm -hmm. And um, everything in between, you know, we'll we'll do one-offs, we'll do prototypes, and and we'll we'll sell to um, machine shops who who need some fabricated work done, and um, everything in between. So so it's like a so so how, how was your what was your path from uh, assembly worker to uh, VP of Biz Dev? Like, did you go through some other stuff? Why out of the production and into the kind of the business portion of the business? Um, I. You know, I studied um, business in college, and had an affinity for it. Um, was Boston College? Uh, well, not, well, Northeastern, Northeastern. But in Boston is yep. what I meant. Yeah, love Boston. Uh, yeah, um, great town. Yep. And um, you know, like I said, came back and and wanted to help out, but at a higher level. I didn't want to do assembly work anymore, um, and I I wasn't, uh, um, you know. I wasn't interested in running a machine either. I, I just wanted to, to help. And to be honest, when I first started, I, I don't I don't think I knew what exactly I wanted to do. I just wanted to get in there and and, and help. So um, at first I, I did sales for heaters um, and worked with our customers. I did inside and outside. So I traveled around and visited. I learned a lot about what our customers do, um, what makes what, what's important for them and, and, and how uh, important quality is for them. Um, and then uh, after doing sales on the heater side um, and uh, the previous owner for high tech left, I started to manage that side of the business with the sheet metal. And um, I had to be a lot more hands-on learning how uh, we start, we made that product range um, as opposed to the heaters now. Um, and then um, a few people left over the years and, and now um, I'm still here and, <laughs> and sticking with the business. So um, my efforts now are, are mostly towards business development. Um, I, I've, I've been there long enough where I, I know what areas we need to improve on. And um, and that's where, where I spend most of my time. So what is like what does a day in life look like kind of when you're doing like business development work? What does what does that look like? Um, well, we um, l like a lot of companies in Connecticut um, uh, started pursuing uh, lean initiatives um, over the last couple of years, um, and and so a lot of what I do as far as biz dev um, is is mostly on the production side and and running kaizens and um, continuous improvement efforts. Um, we um, 
have our ISO 9001 2015 certification. So um, our lead auditor and I make sure that we're um, that our quality management system is um, working the way that it should be. Sure. Um, making sure that we're continuous improving, continuously improving. Um, I will also go out and find new business. So I'm, I'm still in sales um, on the heater side and on the, um, the high tech side. Uh, but then we do a lot of um, uh, trade association work and communi community outreach, uh, which I participate a lot in. Uh, you and I know each other from Senator Murphy's uh, Manufacturing and Aerospace Advisory Council. Um, like I said, we're also involved heavily in the Plastics Industry Association. So um, we'll go down to D.C., for example. We have a fly-in every year where we go and speak to our um, uh, representatives and in Congress and um, talk about how important plastics is. And um, we uh, advocate for uh, uh, workforce development on um, uh, the state level and uh, – you know, we, we go to Cheshire High School every year and speak to the kids there uh, uh, during sophomore career day. Sure. Um, we, uh, you know, the the Plastics Industry Association runs um, uh, the second biggest trade show in the world for plastics called the uh, NPE. And um, uh, my dad will actually chair that show next year, um, which is pretty exciting for us. Yeah, it so, is. Um, yeah, we do. We... Uh, you know, as far as biz dev, you know, getting out there, networking, um, working with the community, and and find and still finding time to grow the business and improve our production efforts. Um, that's that's kind of what I do. Just kind of got that real owner's head on, right? It's being out there, face of the business, doing the networking, plus inside, seeing how we can do what we do better. It's a busy, it's a busy life there, Tom. We all wear a lot of hats, that's for <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> So when you're out there doing sales, I think it's not something that we've talked a lot about on the podcast, which I think, you know, uh, if you've been in business for long enough, I think we all know sales is, you know, really like the lifeblood. We got to keep kind of new work coming in the door. Yeah. Um, so, so what's kind of your strategy on that? How are you out there kind of drumming up new business? Well, um, it's important to be responsive uh, is what I've always found. Um, if we get an opportunity, um, I, I think you need to um, be responsive within the same day. Um, and it's, it's always good to go visit a customer after they've given you an opportunity. So, um, we don't do any design work in house. Everything that we do is contract work and is to a customer's print. So, um, it all starts when someone needs something, um, and, and, and we get that drawing. Um, and then it comes down to us understanding how we can best service them. So, um, you know, for example, I sat in on a design review meeting with a, a customer of ours who makes um, uh, lines that um, do a number of things, but uh, one of them is put the needles inside of syringes, um, mass volume. Sure. Um, so um, we we make uh, enclosures for them that go into these lines, and um, they're uh, developing some new designs. And, and And I'll go and I'll sit in and 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 take part, uh, put my engineer hat on, and uh, see how we can Im improve their designs and manufacturability of them. Um, there's also uh, networking that, that needs to be done. So I'm, sure. I'm always out there um, attending networking events and, and joining groups. Um, I know you're a member of EMA, which we, we just applied to uh, recently. So oh, nice. hopefully be um, seeing you down there as well. Yeah, man. Um, and, um, uh, you know, plastics, meetings. Um, sure. Yeah. Get, Got to get your head out Customers there. Customers all over the place. Uh, where, where's kind of your main customer focus all over the country, international? On the plastic side, all over the country. Yeah. Um, on the in the sheet metal side, it's mostly in Connecticut. Gotcha. Yeah. And what have you seen in terms of the sheet metal side growth and, and what do you see on the industrial heater side on the plastic side? Do you guys project growth in that area? And what does like staffing look like, uh, you know, at industrial heater? Just adding business, adding staff, maintaining? Yeah, so um, we're we've we've remained stable. We, we're right at that fifty people mark. Uh, we've been there for a while, and um, that's that's kind of our sweet spot. Um, you know, we um, uh, find more growth potential on the sheet metal side. I think um, you know it, it's hard not to take part in all of the stuff that's going on in Connecticut right now um, with all of the, def the defense spending that our state gets, um, and then. Um, uh, with the the capabilities of our, our equipment, we, we have more capacity, I think, than than um, than we currently 
make then, for yeah, so, yeah. so yeah. you could you so. could sell into your capacity and like have room to kind of move on that yep. what are you guys are you guys facing any challenges on this on a silver tsunami side I know something that you know has come up a little bit at the Senator Murphy Council and just the transition of baby boom generation yeah. is that something that you guys are facing a little bit um, we we um, have always had a culture of craftsmen at our company uh, people who knew how to make the product from beginning to end mm -hmm. so you're you're talking people who understood uh, materials and and um, uh, electrical engineering and um, how the equipment works and and they knew how to drive the product from start to finish um, well now it's a little bit separate um, and as are those that generation of our company is starting to move on um, we we need to standardize and train and make sure that the people that are here um, can continue to do that work um, and that's that's challenging, but we're working on it. Yeah, what, what's kind of been the approach? Listen, a lot of people are facing that exact same thing. I think it's a, you know, people talk about the kind of the double challenge of having older, you know, the older generation and the younger generation and transitioning the knowledge. But something that I don't think has been talked about as much is that it's not just transferring the knowledge. The way we manufacture isn't the way a lot of those people that manufacture for a long time. Yeah, right. Um, and it's become, you know, probably in part because of sort of lean and Kaizen events and in part because of technology, you know, it is it is a little bit more, you know, working on this process or that process versus like seeing the whole part through. Yeah. So what strategy are you guys using to kind of capture the knowledge that this great group of people have that helped build this business and sustain it for, you know, almost mm -hmm. hundred years mm -hmm. and transfer that into like the new way to, to kind of keep that around. Do you guys have a strategic way of addressing that? Um, it's, it's through standardization. So, um, you, you know, in the old days, someone might be given a, a specs for a heater and say, um, okay, design this and make sure everything's right. And they would see the whole thing through, like I said, um, but we can't rely on that anymore, right? So um, uh, rules-based templating and standards for our engineering practices need to be um, uh, saved and implemented so that when future engineers come who don't have a lifetime of experience making heaters, they can um, easily put in the important functions that we need and what the output is, is um, essentially saved and um, the equations that we use are, are, are still valid. So, um, and then on the production side, um, you know, if, if things need to be done a certain way, um, it needs to be uh, uh, replicated consistently and the operators need to be um, trained in a standardized way. So um, I, I think uh, it, it's, it's super important in any manufacturing uh, environment to standardize your process. But as we watch the silver tsunami come in and the, the experienced workforce leave, it's going to become even more important for us to, to save that information. Cause those people, they're, they're not going to be around for forever. You know? Yeah. Yeah. We're coming to the end of the road in a lot of cases. What, yeah. what, how much is technology, you know, information technology, manufacturing technology playing in the role to transfer that information? Sounds like it's a ton. Yeah. So, um, you know, on, on the engineering side, you know, we, we have still have drawings in house that are done by hand um, uh, on drafting tables. So how do you say that? Well, well now all of our work is done in SolidWorks and AutoCAD. So um, you can use those programs to, um, to replicate the same outputs that you, when you put in certain inputs. So a lot of our push is, all right. Um, if, wait, 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 what, do you, what do you mean when you put it? So you could take SolidWorks mm -hmm. and then you put in like what inputs you're saying, just like scan something and put it in or you have to really like redraw the, it? The data. So if if um, if a customer needs um, certain um, features on their heater band, um, they'll specify it and uh, we put it into SolidWorks or AutoCAD and the output is drawn up automatically, right? right. So uh, maybe a couple features need some, some finagling. Um, you might need to add a feature by hand because you can't, it's not gonna do everything for you. Sure. Um, but the important things, the things that uh, make our quality so great, um, those things need to be saved and Templated is, yeah. is the phrase Templated. that I've been using. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And are you like, are you, are you successfully getting people to kind of buy in to this new approach and and kind of work together, right? Because you got to take maybe some of the more comfort with the computers and stuff like that of the newer generation, mm -hmm. but that like know how and the ability to serve the customer of the 
you know, of the of the older generation, marry those together. You guys tackling that that challenge head on? Yeah, and it, it's so surprising to me to to go through this process and try to um, work with people on change. Um, and I, I I'm I'm a change agent, uh, change agent, change agent, and I'll 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 say that about myself. Um, and I I look forward to change. I I promote it. I advocate for it. Um, but most people don't like that. <laughs> so, True. yeah. So, um, uh, I, I found that, uh, once people are trained, um, they, they get into the habit of doing things, uh, the way that they've, they've done it. And even, even though, um, maybe, uh, management would like to change the way that things are done. Um, you're always going to have some resistance because people just, they, they, they found a way to do it that, that worked for them. Um, and you just gonna have to work through the new process. I think, I think once people see that a new process is better and they've used it and it, and it works, then, um, then change can happen, but it's, it's much harder than you might think. <laughs> How do you get the, you know, is there an approach or like a system that you've used or steps or whatever the way you think about it to get buy-in on that change? Cause listen, change is hard, yeah. but it's impossible if people aren't work and rowing in the same direction. Yeah. I mean, if, if there's a secret answer out there, I'd love to hear it. <laughs> um, the approach, uh, that, that we use, um, uh, is through, um, um, you know, continuous improvement. And, you know, the, the phrase I like to use is through Kaizen. Um, you know, you, you, you look at the value stream of a process and, and find, uh, where the waste is, try to remove the waste. Um, you meet with people to, to review, um, what the new process might be. And, and, uh, what's critical is, is you need to have buy-in from the, from the, the person that you're working with or from the people that you're working with. Um, the solution should be partly their own. It shouldn't be one person telling someone else how to do something. Um, my job is to advocate for the goal and to, and to make the direction clear and to be persistent and to follow up. Um, but, I can't sit in someone else's shoes and do the work for them. They have to ultimately find out how to do it themselves and, and find out that it's better to do it a different way. Maybe it's not better to do it that way. And we, we find that out together, but, um, ultimately. So what's the, what's your, I think, I think that's the key right there, you know, is that get that buy-in right. Working together, it's getting them on board, making them part of the solution and not sort of like dictating from on high. Yep. So, I mean, how do you do that? What's your approach? Um, you, you, you need to involve the people that are going to, um, have an impact on the process. And, um, I, th I found that it's better to, uh, to guide in the direction that it's, that you'd like to see it go in and have them come up with a the solution themselves. Um, and, and then follow up on it and hold, hold them to it and, and, and make sure that they're pursuing it, um, you know, have you had a particular like success that you that you're particularly proud of? Anything like you'd like to share? Any real challenge or obstacle that you were like, oh, not sure, we'll make that, or or even not even something that's super challenging, but just a change that that comes to mind? Um, I'm a, a a bit of a perfectionist, and I, I feel like nothing. You're never gonna get there, so I'm constantly trying to move in, into the, uh, a more perfect direction. Um, we, we did have some sex success last year, uh, with a, um, an improvement effort to, um, install visual boards into our manufacturing process and, sure. um, reduce the work and process inventories that we had. Um, and that did work immediately and, and had some impact, um, and increased our, our throughput rate, um, dramatically actually. Um, and so now we're, we're, we're trying to find ways to increase that even further. Sure. Sure. Take yeah. it to the next level. Yeah. Do you guys celebrate when you find something go like that to kind of encourage more or is there a way to acknowledge the success? Yeah. Um, you know, something simple, like even just uh, a pizza party, um, goes a long way. A hundred percent. No, look, I, you know, something that I've been always, I, I, I sort of found out about myself is like, I'm more of the guy that likes to keep doing stuff yep. and I don't usually stop to even have the pizza party or whatever, but it, dude, yep. just having that quick stop and throw the pizza party, do that quick thing. I think it, um, 
I think it's I think it's really great, and that helps to yeah. build camaraderie and, and share that success. So I, I know that the you know lean and the kaizen you were talking about something that's been over the last several years that you guys have really gotten into. Have you partnered with any outside firm to like help you get through that? Be reading books like what's the how'd you guys do that? Yeah. Um, so Constep is just a great change agent um, in the in the state. Um, we sent myself included um, a couple of us to their um, um, certification champion was a continuous improvement champion course um, that they run, which I, I would highly recommend to anybody out there. Um, they also do what's called a prime event and they'll come in and they'll run Kaizen's with you. Yep. Um, and that's kind of where we, we got our inspiration and we started to see the light. Um, there's uh, several books out there that you can uh, look into and um, the best way to do it is to go and, and uh, visit companies that are actually doing this stuff. Um, you know, I know, uh, I'm a huge Westminster tool fan and, uh, those guys are doing such a great job down there and they've, it's taken them a while to get to this stage. So it's great to say, oh, if I start now down this line, I might, um, be able to replicate some of the things that they're doing down there. Um, as far as workforce development and, um, lean initiatives and the Westminster Academy, it's, it's incredible. So, um, that, that's where you find your inspiration and, 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 um, uh, you know, your how to. Sure. Sure. And that yeah. all came partially right through the networking and that's how you meet new people and learn new stuff. Yep. Um, so I just want to, you know, I think we haven't talked a lot about concept, uh, on the podcast and you know, they'll be on one day, I'm sure. But, you know, I, I think they're, they are a good change agent and a lot of value. Maybe you can just talk a little bit about, you know, um, how that engagement was and, and, and the value that you guys are getting out of it. Sure. So, um, they're an affiliate of CBIA, um, and, you know, the, the services they provide, um, are funded by the state. So if, if anyone's, um, interested in working with them, don't be afraid that they're going to charge you for it. Um, I would suggest reaching out and setting up a meeting and, and, and seeing what they have to offer. Um, the, the people that we've worked with there have been so qualified and knowledgeable, and I've been so impressed at how they just roll up their sleeves and dive right in. And, uh, and, and help you work through some of these problems that you're having. Um, I, I'd, I'd strongly recommend it to anybody in manufacturing. What is, um, what have you seen already business impact? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, after our, our first round of Kaizen's, we had, uh, uh, an immediate impact on our, uh, throughput rate for the, the heater side. We did another Kaizen with them, um, for the sheet metal side and our, our quality, um, uh, internal nonconformance has dropped significantly, uh, based off of efforts that they've helped us with. So. Dude, those are, those are some, uh, those are some pretty, uh, significant wins. Those yeah. are pretty significant wins. What do you, what do you see, uh, kind of into the future, you know, for you and, and for industrial heater, like, uh, you know, you're, you're still a young guy, you know, what, what's kind of your thoughts on the, on the plans for the future? Um, plans for the future. Um, well, I, I'd like to see us, um, get to, uh, a, a, a place where, um, we are, um, I gotta think about that one for a sec. That's all right. Yeah, man. I totally, uh, totally think about it. It's a big, you know, listen, it's a super big question and it's a big, you know, it's a big tradition to yeah. kind of, you know, have on your back and, um, you know, I, I would like to grow the company personally, um, a, and potentially, um, grow our international business. Um, I, I visited China, uh, two years ago and visited, um, other heater makers over there and to see what, what it was like. Um, I think that we have a lot to offer in that market where actually more injection molding and extrusion, um, equipment is being manufactured. If we can sell direct into China, uh, Europe, uh, India is going to be a, a huge market in the, in the future for the heater band business. Um, we can find ways to manufacture or sell overseas. I think that'd be great. Um, on the, the sheet metal side, um, I'd, I'd love to get more involved into um, military and defense. Um, I, I think a, a lot of us in Connecticut would, um, but uh, there, we have some work to do. Um, to increase our capacity and, and, and uh, our standardization level.
Yeah. So well, working with concepts going to get you there. And yeah. those sound like really uh, admirable, uh, you know, admirable goals and uh, certainly wish you uh, the best of success on, on all that. And before we kind of go to uh, rapid uh, fire, we do know each other through Chris Murphy's advisory council, um, but I am going to ask you a slightly non-manufacturing question. I've been trying all episode to try and think about how I could work this in like surreptitiously, but there really wasn't a way to do it. So I'm just going to ask you straight out. Um, on the fish run for New Year's this year at MSG, which one was your favorite show? Um, I the the New Year's Eve show um, uh, was too scary for me because <laughs> um, the, the lead guitarist got stuck up on his rig, and so it was a great show. But I have to say, it was the night before thirtieth. Um, yeah, the thirtieth. So thirtieth show. All right, well, you heard yeah, it here first, guys. Yep. Tom, Tom says the Tom says the thirtieth. So we'll look for uh, comments uh, on that. I didn't. I missed that show, so we'll have to see how that uh, how that plays out. Um, but uh, anyway, thank you very much for sharing. Glad to, I wanted to find a way to get fish on my podcast, and uh, that was a uh, that was a way to do it. So listen, um, let me go to rapid fire round of questions. You ready? Yep. All right. Cool. Uh, so Red Sox or Yankees? Yankees Patriots. No. Oh. Uh, Starbucks or Dunkin' Donuts? Um, I'm going to go Starbucks. Um, I'm a big local coffee guy though. Uh, Brantford has uh, Willoughby's coffee um, imported. They roast it right there and I'll give them a plug. There you go. Willoughby's yep. coffee in, yep. in uh, Brantford. Yep. Um, when you, uh, when you go away, take some time off, you a staycation guy or exotic destination? Exotic. Love to travel. Uh, iPhone or Android? iPhone. Sports car or SUV? I drive a Jeep, but uh, would love a sports car one day. <laughs> if uh, if you had to do something other than what you're doing today, and it could be anything, uh, what would you do? Um, I really love to travel. I'd probably, uh, I don't know, be a travel writer or something like that, like an Anthony Bourdain. <laughs> Anthony Bourdain. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Uh, do you have a favorite business book, Tom? Um, I, when I was in college, I loved, um, the intelligent investor by Benjamin Graham. Um, that was, those were during my finance days, but, um, I would recommend, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about lean today, uh, lean thinking by, um, James Womack is, um, really relevant, especially for Connecticut manufacturers. They use a couple examples in there, um, like wire mold and, mm -hmm. um, uh, Pratt and Whitney. UTC are in the book. Um, and if if you're in manufacturing, I strongly recommend seeing what the, these guys have to say about it. Nice. Yeah. Uh, what's one thing that you learned early in your career, earlier in your life that's uh, propelled you to uh, the success you've had so far? Um, staying persistent. And, um, you know, sometimes it seems like uh, you've arrived at a dead end, um, it, you know, businesses face a lot of challenges and and sometimes you you uh, you need to work through them rather than just give up so um i i, I found that out early and I've, I've watched um successful people like my my grandfather my dad and um, other uh managers that i've had work through these problems and seem to create miracles um so um Stay persistent. persistent. Yeah. yeah. Um, and what's one thing that you've learned later in your career, later in your life, that you feel like if you went back and told young Tom and he listened to you, it'd be a real, uh, it'd be a real boost for him. Um, let's see. I always say I wish I studied engineering first and then business second or something like that. Um, and, and spent more time um, working on the technical side of things. Um, I love business, but uh, I, I, I would love to have more fundamental uh, knowledge and use in, in engineering. I'll say huh. that, yeah. That's a really a strong, that's a strong takeaway. I'd recommend that to anybody too who's, um, if, if they're thinking about studying business, they, they know that they love business and they're going to go into it, great. But um, consider um, specializing first and then getting into the business after. I, I've had to pick up a lot of my... Um, engineering acumen after the fact, uh, which is fine, but. But it would have been easier the other first way around. way around. There you go. Well, listen, but you couple that with uh, the perseverance and uh, you could still get there. Yep. So listen, we talked about a bunch of stuff today, uh, you know, lean, perseverance, uh, family business, all kinds of stuff. And uh, i just like to end with, you know, each of us kind of picking one thing that um, if we, if, if, the, if someone listened to this podcast and walked away with this one thing and implemented it in their life, it, it'd make a real difference. And I wonder what you, uh, what you think that'd be. Um, let's see. Continuous improve, continuously improve. Um, you can never get to that perfect state, but you might as well try, um, keep pushing and, uh, 
keep keep improving. Yeah, I like that. I think the other thing we talked about too, which I think is so critically important, and it kind of dovetails with what you said, which is, you know, to effectively continuously improve, you need to bring people on board mm -hmm. and not kind of tell them what to do. They've got to be, you know, hand in hand part of the solution. I think you had said earlier, got to make it their own um, and not just tell them what to do. And I think that's such an important lesson and an important takeaway that can never be, you know, talked about too much. And I think in business, sometimes for the sake of speed, we try and tell people what to do. And I think ultimately that just slows us down. So yeah. I think that was a great point that you brought up and I super appreciate you sharing that with the audience. Yeah. Tom, it's been awesome having you on. Uh, great to see you back in Connecticut. Um, and, um, you know, again, thanks for coming on the show, man. I super appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me, Ari. I appreciate it. Big fan of the show and good luck to you. Thank you. Made in America with Ari Santiago is brought to you by IT Direct. As always, thanks so much for tuning in. I definitely want your feedback and hope you subscribe. But what I want the most is to build a community where we learn and grow with each other. I hope you're getting a lot of value out of the time we're spending together. Thanks so much for listening. I'll see you next time.